sisters, brothers, seekers, peace be with you on this last day of the year. Only a few hours left of 2017. And in fact, in places like Samoa, Kiribati, New Zealand, 2018 is already upon us. In church terms, however, we are well into the new year. It began with Advent, when we were invited to follow the whole story about the coming of our Lord, hear the prophecies, get to know the players, movers and shakers, and prepare our hearts and minds for the great miracle that Christmas is. Miracle of light in the dark. Miracle of God with us. Miracle of heaven and earth emerging. Miracle of birth. Miracle of finding love in strange ways and places. Miracle of the unexpected. Miracle of peace. All these miracles in the context of an oppressing empire imposing decrees and orders on the lives of ordinary people in the context of everyday struggles and big life events, in the context of imminent danger to vulnerable children in the form of poverty, homelessness, and paranoid dictators. The big climax of this story is, of course, Holy Night, Christmas Eve, when we are invited to join the shepherds at the manger and accept God's offer to not be afraid, but to receive the little Lord Jesus in our lives and our hearts. Make our own heart the manger, giving shelter and embrace to the child that is God. But the story continues after that. The miracles keep happening, and the element of surprise is constantly with us. It happens when we read and hear about the life of Jesus and how he met people. And it happens when we open ourselves to the meaning and the message of God becoming human in Christ. One such story is before us today, on the first Sunday of Christmas, when we are in the orbit of Epiphany, the moment where the whole world gets to know, whole world gets to know who this child born to Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem really is. Here we do not encounter the three wise men following the star from the east, as Matthew tells us, but Luke's account of two elderly citizens of Jerusalem, Simeon and Anna who become the first interpreters of the significance of Jesus' birth and proclaimers to the world. The venue is the temple, and here we get a glimpse into the customs and traditions of Jewish families of the time, where a newborn male child is presented to observe the purity laws of the Hebrew Bible related to childbirth. At the temple, the parents of Jesus offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. These details in Luke's Christmas story share important elements of Jesus' identity and origin as a person of Israel. And they also make very clear where in Jewish society his family exists. They exist among the poor. The two turtle doves Jesus' family presents are the sacrifices designated for the poor, according to the Levitical code. Now, when we read the Gospel of Luke, we are sure to notice Jesus' affinity and attentiveness to the needs of the poor. He speaks of, this, of the poor in his prophetic inaugural speech, where he claims he is anointed to bring good news to the poor. In the Sermon on the Plain, he blesses you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Later in the Gospel, Jesus juxtaposes poor to rich people, hinting that the poor have access to the kingdom in a way the rich have not. So Luke's story about the presentation at the temple 
gives us a background to Jesus' stand on the issue of poverty and the gospel. It is much more than a cause Jesus has picked to champion for. Luke wants to stress that when Jesus talks about the poor, he's talking about himself. The place and experience of the poor is the experience of Jesus from his childhood. But the focus in Luke's story of the presentation is not on the poverty issue. It surely is an important detail of the family situation. But Luke doesn't dwell there. Through the characters of Anna and Simeon, we are moved forward to a new air of expectancy and excitement. Songs, passionate declarations, and high expectations are shared in the open. We are invited to lift our eyes towards what Jesus will do in the future. He is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, says Simeon to Mary. And Anna, the prophet who lived in the temple, fasting and praying night and day after becoming a widow at a young age, came to see the baby and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Where I come from, New Year's Eve is celebrated separately in our lectionary. So if I was preaching to, in Iceland today, I would not be preaching on the presentation in the temple, but instead on Luke's parable on the barren fig tree. A quick reminder, this short parable tells of a man who had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and for three years he has been coming and looking for fruit on it and still found none. So he says to his workers, cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? A worker makes a plea for the tree to wait one more year. And the owner agrees. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Every time I hear this story, I think, isn't it a charming message to take with you into the new year? sort of taking you straight down the path of really feeling your inefficiency and worthlessness right at the most vulnerable moment of the threshold between the old year and the new. Firmly reminding you that you are on the clock here. Your days are numbered and you better pull your act together. Otherwise, cut down. While this parable can surely also serve as a promise of the grace of God who gives us yet another year to grow and bear fruit, it is easy to perceive it as ironic and gloomy when paralleled with the words of promise, light, and glory in the presentation story we contemplate today. It is easy to feel the judgment of God coming down on you, on this moment of truth when we have to give account for our doings and beings on the year that is passing. One man that really drew our attention to what the fear of God's judgment does to your soul and spirit is Martin Luther. And honestly, you can't really say goodbye to 2017 without commemorating the commemoration itself. One of Luther's most famous words, and he was a wordy man, are to be found in a letter to Philip Melanchthon. Luther wrote in 1521. I think these words show Luther's remarkable ability to reconcile the seriousness of sin and the burden of the self-conscious sinner on the one hand and the firm belief in the gospel of Christ's promise, light and glory on the other. Luther writes, God does not save people who are only fictitious sinners. Be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly, for he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. As long as we are here, we have to sin. This life is not the dwelling place of righteousness, but we look for new heavens and a new earth 
in which righteousness dwells. This is a wonderful, down-to-earth attitude towards the earthly life and our daily existence. Combined with the faith of us being saved, waited for by the new heavens and the new earth that Christ has prepared for us and in which righteousness dwells. My husband and I are great fans of the English author Neil Gaiman and recently we've been enjoying the BBC Radio Theatre version of one of his books. Amongst his work I found this New Year's greeting that in its contemporary way echoes Luther's 15th century encouragement to be a sinner and sin boldly, since that is simply the human condition and therefore the precondition to bring the promised light and glory into being. And the greeting goes like this. I hope in this year to come you make mistakes. Because if you are making mistakes, then you are making new things, trying new things, learning, living, pushing yourself, changing yourself, changing your world. You're doing things you've never done before. And more importantly, you are doing something. So that's my wish for you and all of us, and my wish for myself, and it continues, make new mistakes. Make glorious, amazing mistakes. Make mistakes nobody's ever made before. Don't freeze, don't stop. Don't worry that it isn't good enough or it isn't perfect. Whatever it is, art or love or work or family or life, make your mistakes next year and forever. End of this quote, paraphrasing Luther's sin boldly comment. Do not be afraid was the message of Christmas night. Today the message is do not be afraid of the new year or the things you have to do and the mistakes you are bound to make. Like Simeon's, our eyes have seen the salvation of our Lord and we can be dismissed in peace into the new year, into the uncertain future according to God's word. We can carry the good news of God's salvation speak about the child to all, like the prophet Anna in the temple. Women speaking about their experience and what matters most to them is actually another thing that 2017 has brought us. Me Too, She Persisted and Women's March are among taglines that caught our attention on social media and lifted up the ugly reality of institutional, systematic, and commercial patriarchy and sexual imbalance that permeates our cultures. Women speaking about their experiences has always been a fundamental part of the Christian faith and the story of Jesus. From Mary, who stated to, be, to the angel and the world that she was a virgin, even when she was expecting, to Anna, who spoke about the child to all, to the women who witnessed Christ risen at the tomb and went to tell the others. Believing these women has been the challenge and the response of the church for 2,000 years. May we believe, continue to believe, that these women and others tell us about their experience and to make them a model for our faith and courage in 2018. Amen.